Good day, everybody. This is Tosca at NGO Soul and Strategy. It's been a while since I've done a recording and I'm looking forward to this conversation. And today I am talking with Kirthi Jajakumar and with Leela Billing. And they are two women who know a lot about feminist leadership. And I've recorded a couple of interviews with well-known feminist leadership specialists, experts, as well as practitioners, such as uh, Srilatha Vatliwala, such as um, Aruna Rao, such as uh, Abby Maxman at Oxfam America, Joanne Sandler, and Le Lisa Vinneklaassen, but I always want to learn more. So I turn to Leela and to Kirthi to talk more about certain dimensions of that. So Leela and Kirthi, welcome. Hi Tosca, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's great to be here. And uh, let me tell you, dear listeners, a little bit about these two women. So first, Kirthi, Kirthi Jayakumar, she's the founder of the Gender Security Project, which is a research-based project focused on gender digital security from a global South perspective. Very interesting and very important um, uh, topic. She also is the head of training at World Pulse, which is a women-led digital social network of women leading social change. She's a feminist researcher, a peace educator, a facilitator, and a mediator. And she focuses on the agenda behind women, peace, and security. All those things we don't have time to discuss today, but something that are completely really unfamiliar to me. So I would love to at some point learn more from you, Kirthi, about that. She developed an, an award-winning app for survivors of gender-based violence, and she has a degree from Coventry University. And Leela, Leela Billing, is a senior advisor on gender, youth, and movement building. She has worked on many projects, and I'm just mentioning a few. Uh, research into anti-racism in the UK international development sector. She has very importantly developed curricula on feminist leadership and Leela and I have talked about that a little bit in the past and, and created a program, um, an open enrollment program as I understand it, that is still running and that I heartily recommend to you um, if you want to deepen your understanding as a leader and your practice around feminist leadership and we will put links to that in the show notes. She is the co-founder in that capacity of the We Are Feminist Leaders training program on feminist leadership. She was the head of partnership at the Campaign to End Child Marriage, a global youth uh, program coordinator at ActionAid. Uh, she worked as a deputy program director at War Child uh, UK, was um, trained at the Institute of Development Studies and has done a lot of other things that I don't have time to mention. So, um, so two formidable women with us. So listeners, if you want to, if you feel you need more of a foundation in feminist leadership, then please uh, listen to some of my previous podcasts um, on this topic. If I'm gonna, in a very simplistic way, um, uh, define the uh, uh, feminist leadership in two sentences, I'm just going to say that it falls within the realm of transformational leadership, which is overall a school of leadership thinking, which in a nutshell emphasizes the ability of leaders to motivate their staff and volunteers to find intrinsic meaning in their work. So we are talking about leaders who are able to generate a willingness and energy among staff and volunteers to go over and beyond what the job requires of them while being also sufficiently balancing that with a focus on staff and volunteer well-being. Externally, as well as internally, of course, feminist leadership is focused on creating a gender just world. So with that, let me turn to the two of you and ask you, tell me a little bit how you got to the topic and your interest in feminist leadership, and also in that context, how you got to know each other. Maybe, um, Leela, how about starting with you? Yeah, so thank you, uh, Tosca, for the introductions. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, I, I suppose... Uh, my my journey to feminist leadership has been a bit of a winding one. And I think it came about from a bit of a dissatisfaction with the leadership models that I was exposed to 
when I started working in the humanitarian and international development sector. So I started my career in the humanitarian sector where there was a lot of very macho leadership styles, mm -hmm. um, very, you know, the way to get ahead was to emulate a very gung-ho masculine style of leadership. I remember going to a security training once because I was working in conflict affected areas and asking, you know, when, when are we going to talk about gender based violence and the risks to, you know, to me as a woman doing this work in this context? And I was told by all the senior leaders leading this training, you know, that's just no, we don't need to do that. That's just just not relevant. Wow. So so it started in the humanitarian sector. And then I went to other NGOs where not so much macho, but very paternalistic leadership styles where I felt very suffocated. I felt that I was unable to grow and I had a lot to offer, but there were very few growth opportunities, very little power sharing going on, you know, leaders who'd been, been in place for several years. And then we get to the women's rights organizations where, you know, working for organizations where there was a big commitment to gender equality, but a real kind of queasiness around actually talking about feminism or embedding true feminist leadership principles. So in those organizations, I found it was okay to speak about gender, but not feminism. And I think this speaks to a growing trend in, in, in the international development sector. In many organizations, it's okay to talk about uh, gender, but not feminism, to the extent that feminism is no longer required to perform gender related work. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the, le in the leadership models in a lot of those organizations, I experience things like founder syndrome, power hoarding. I've worked in environments in the women's rights sector where minoritized groups of women can feel incredibly silenced. So I suppose that left me a bit disillusioned. Um, and then finally, just to wrap up, I did a leadership fellowship with uh, my friend Natalie uh, a few years ago before COVID hit. And this was targeted at, at, at women leaders in the women in the women and girls sector. But, you know, the content of that programme, although there were great bits to it, we were really dismayed by the lack of feminist analysis in that in that curriculum. And that's what really prompted us to kind of set up We Are Feminist Leaders, which, as you said, is a very small, very modest initiative that um, supports emerging leaders to start to embed feminist leadership principles into their work. So that's 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 the kind of the winding road that brought me here so super interesting i have to off script follow up for one moment i'm really intrigued by what you say that you think it's kind of permissible to talk about gender in ngos and other development organizations but you say even at this moment in time talking about feminism is shied away from do you find that that is generally the practice i think in certain parts of the sector i mean like you like you said you know, as we've discussed before, Tosca, there is a bit of a fad around feminist leadership at the moment. So there are exceptions. But I think what the issue has been is that um, the radical potential of gender and work around gender mainstreaming got diluted over mm. the years. You know, over the decades, it got diluted. It lost its radical edge. Um, the ties with feminism, what started out as a very radical agenda, the ties with feminism, once these concepts entered institutional and bureaucratic settings, they became loosened and okay. diluted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. It's probably not the only um, concept that that it gets diluted through Absolutely. institutional um, uh, uptake to a certain extent, but yeah, but we don't have time to go. So let me discipline myself. Kirthi, over to you. Um, how did you get to feminist leadership? How does it play? How did it start to play up in your, in your life? I think Tosca, my story does touch upon a lot of shared experiences with Leila. So I won't repeat those pieces, the observations of it all, but I want to go back further in time to really speak about how observing the spaces around me as a child really made me understand the way we consume leadership and the problematic nature of it. Uh, whether it was my home or the political leaders I was watching on television, I always found the men up and about. And here in Indian society, that is normalized even more so. It's just the blueprint, as you will. Now, the bigger problem I noticed in this was the women who were being included in the spaces of leadership, so to speak, were becoming men. 
So they were gatekeeping with the same values of patriarchy, were exhibiting the same kind of hostility and the exclusion of other women. And so while on the one side, there was talk about how the glass ceiling must be shattered, no one was talking about who those shattered pieces were falling on. So the whole focus is on leadership and then co-opting women into the glove of leadership that capitalism and patriarchy has normalized, but not really about how can we feminize leadership. Um, and that sort of took me on a different direction. Um, and I'm big in astrophysics in the moment, so forgive me if you, if you have some of those metaphors dropped in here. But we've all been taught to think that the sun is the center of the solar system and the planets are sort of moving around, right? But if you maybe took out Jupiter from the solar system, you might have the entire asteroid belt collapsing on the Earth and life as we know it would end. So what I'm trying to say here is that the idea of leadership, of one being in the center and everyone revolving around it, is it's actually dead on arrival. I'm not even going to say it's outdated. It was dead on arrival. The very fact that you can center decision making or power in one person automatically dehumanizes everybody else's agency. And that's been my biggest problem with feminist, sorry, with leadership and with wanting to feminize leadership. But the way in which feminist leadership is being practiced, unfortunately, is also somehow spiraling out of control into that space. We can't afford to train more women to become the leaders that we have aboard, um, to, to, be, to turn out to be the very leaders that have gate kept our inclusion in the first place. We really need to think about leadership as a corollary to follow followership, both of which have to continue to exist together. And that's my ongoing pursuit. And I don't think I found it just yet, but there are beautiful pieces that I collect like a magpie, one of which is Vila's amazing program and this very conversation as it, as it were. Wow, so much that we, that we really should dive into further. Um, yeah, uh, let, let me think about how we can have a follow-up conversation on this. For now, let's see this as an introductory conversation. So let, let's turn to that, you know me, I like to think about what happens inside organizations, whether it's intra-organizational or within a network of organizations, um, uh, a confederation, a federation, whatever the, the organizational structure might be. So when you think about the way your definitions of feminist leadership, um, what do you, what are its unique strengths? And particularly if I, if I know nothing about feminist leadership and I come into an organization where there is an honest attempt and we're all humans, right? But uh, to practice feminist leadership, what would I see then? Maybe Kirthi, do you wanna start? Sure. So I want to go back to the first nonprofit I founded to share a couple of examples from that. So it was called the Red Elephant Foundation, and the idea being to paint the elephant in the room red so people would sit up and take notice. Um, and we were a collective. Now, a lot of people would think of me as the person who founded it and therefore led it, but I would really like to deviate from that image and say we were a collective of humans really trying to make a difference in the world. Now, what did that look like in terms of leadership? The first thing we thought about was to center every human being that wanted to be part of the change-making process. So we each had a vision and assembling that vision to create the big picture for what the organization would do was the first step. So if somebody came in saying, look, I'm really passionate about peace and environment or peace and climate change, they found a place there, but they just had to fit that into the bigger vision, which would be the larger theme of peace and equality. So the second piece in that was also normalizing the human, which means normalizing care, normalizing wellness, normalizing their own skills and their agency in developing the projects they wanted to develop instead of looking at capitalistic numbers and productivity. So we never had deadlines, we had a zero deadline culture. So mm. if we worked with a school to produce workshops, we told the school that we would be there and we would have something to produce. But the best way to make that effective was not to hold people accountable to a date, but to have as much help and resources available to the folks who would show up at the school to do the workshop. So they were never one person sitting at a desk and slogging to produce results. We were a community, we were a village, we were having each other's back to produce the outcomes we wanted. Tosca, I have to tell you, I went into this without a plan. And mm -hmm. the plan grew so beautifully because more people were willing to take ownership of this vision. And over a span of four and a half years before we had to close down, 
um, because of COVID, uh, we successfully trained over 36,000 children um, across the world on case education curriculums. Uh, we worked with 45,000 survivors of gender-based violence. Now, these numbers in a capitalistic report would tie to a strategy. I just want to tie it to the hearts of people who are willing to make that journey to make that change possible. So that's my formula, if that makes any any value addition to the world. Well, so. yes, it does, because it makes it very concrete. I, I will have, in, in a moment, I'll ask a question about what kind of trade-offs and limitations did you also encounter, unless maybe I'm, uh, maybe there are none, but I'm, I'm curious about that, but let me first turn to Leela and say, so Leela, um, same question. If I had no clue about feminist leaders, how would I see it? And where do you think it shines in, in unique ways from other models of mm -hmm. what we call transformational leadership? Yeah, so there's two, two parts to that question. I want to, maybe I can give some examples in terms of what it looks and feels like. And in doing so, maybe I can uh, amplify the work of organisations doing really excellent work on this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we can see it in the way organisations are structured and the way resources are allocated. So if we take uh, the Canadian feminist organisation and international organisation into Paris, everyone takes home the same base salary in the organization. And then there's increments for single mothers, people with the, um, employees with caregiving responsibilities, people who have a disabled spouse. Uh, they provide childcare funds for evenings and weekends when you have to work uh, over, over those periods. And, you know, of course that's quite an unusual example, but we can also see it in, in policies and rules and procedures in organizations. So for example, maybe it's about perform performance appraisal processes that don't just center individual me metrics of success. Mm -hmm. So, you know, perhaps there's a priority on the extent to which an employee is collaborating and sharing power with others, um, the ways in which employees are contributing to processes of organizational collective care. And then, you know, we have to talk about organizational norms and culture, mm -hmm. and that's where it's really felt, you know, so a sense that, you know, I think in a feminist organization that's practicing this well, is it okay to bring your full self to work and all the messy emotions we have, particularly in this time of COVID, you know, are, are we told to check our emotional baggage at the door? Because our work, you know, we working on social justice issues, this is very emotional work. You know, this is about passion and love for the cause and anger when justice is being denied. And yet, you know, in too many workplaces, we are required to mask these emotions or we're penalized for showing that level of emotionality in the workplace. And I think this is where feminist leadership is really distinct because it's a heart, mind and body practice that allows for the presence of messiness and messy emotions. Um, and I look, I think in terms of how it's distinct, you know, as Shulata Batlivala, who you've spoken to, who originally did, did that such kind of groundbreaking breaking work around feminist leadership, you know, as originally conceived, it's an unapologetically radical and political approach to leadership because it's really about fundamental redistributions of power. And I think the difference is you know, you can adopt a facilitative leadership style without fundamentally challenging power structures. You know, right. it is possible to do that. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it is an approach that requires us to pay attention to other forms of systemic oppression outside of gender. Um, and look, it, it's a bit, like I said, it's heart, mind and soul work. It, it is a, an approach to leadership that really requires us to undergo a process of personal transformation you know, because there's this sense that, look, we can't divorce ourselves from the change we want to see in the world. Yeah. And but Batley Valla says this very well. She says, you know, the self is a site of change and that's where the work starts. Mm. So it's asking a lot of us, you know, it's asking a lot of us. Um, it makes a lot of demands on us. And then I guess finally what I'd say, what makes it distinct, and it'd be interesting to know what you think about this and in terms of other leadership models, Let's talk about the right to joy and pleasure and dreaming. I don't hear about that. I don't know about you. I don't hear about that, those words a lot when we're talking no. about leadership. No. 
And, and feminist leadership, I think, centers this idea of pleasure and dreaming and joy and claiming this right, because it's difficult work. To do it is difficult work. And so you I, may have, sorry, Tosca, you come in. Do you, do you want me to respond to that for a moment? Yeah, yeah. 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 Mostly I agree with you. It's not, those words in particular are not used. They are, they're even, yeah, no, they're not commonly used in the culture of many INGOs, at least that I know. And of course that is a, just a, a limited set. Um, what what is one focus in in the bigger kind of school of of leadership models transformational leadership models is that that um, um, ability of leaders to motivate the willingness and energy and the intrinsic motivation right of 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 work in work and in being their own leader in a shared leadership model. Um, and in that sense, intrinsic motivation often touches upon joy and what brings me joy and what, what do I love and what do I loathe and can I do more of what I love and if possible, I'm willing, of course, to do my part of what I loathe or dislike or I'm not the best in, but I, I want to find, as somebody said recently on another podcast, 20% of my work should be about things that I love and that I'm good in and where I shine, right? Um, so in that sense, I see a little bit of, uh, of an overlap, but you're right, those words as such are quite uncommon. Um, and just another sidebar for a moment. So uh, when I started reading uh, several years ago, the work, work by Srilatha Batliwala and others, um, there was this warning around, but we don't want to uh, essentialize. And, and Kirthi, you used the word um, at one point, I think you used the word um, feminine, but I'm not sure. And I, let me not go back to my nose. No, but, but this idea of, so we don't want to essentialize how women lead as if women lead in certain ways necessarily. And Kirthi, you already, in fact, you said, no, they don't necessarily, right? And they adopt male forms of leadership. So how do we um, navigate around that any risk in essentializing how women lead. Um, Kirti, you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, Tosca, we live in a world that is so busy trying to fit people into formulae. Hmm? So mm -hmm. whether you're from India or you're from the Netherlands or you're from the UK, you're invariably being judged with what the individual's preconceived notions around those labels are. So no matter what you do, you're always going to try to be fit into a box by somebody else who's consuming what you're doing. Now that's a piece that's beyond our control. But what is within our control is really just to keep offering up space to demonstrate ways of doing leadership that do not limit us to those formulae. So if you find a woman who is doing something radically different from what men in suits have done, instead of calling her bossy or shutting her down or saying that she is an outlandish element in what is considered mainstream, then you, you probably want to take a step back to see how you can encourage more women to find her as a role model, uh, to encourage more young women to see that that's a viable option for leadership as well, or even something completely radically different. The problem is that we perceive only a limited number of colors, and then within those limited number of colors, we're, we're told that certain colors are acceptable to paint with, and then anything outside of that, or even painting outside the boundaries of the drawings we are given to paint within is just unacceptable. I want to ask us to reflect really on what is acceptable and unacceptable and whose standards are we using to measure this? Mm -hmm. It's just like Leela said, right? It's like Leela's reference to Bhatiwala's statement about the self. Um, if we can stop, think, pause, reflect, and then invest the wisdom we've collected from what we've reflected on, in making changes in our own perceptions of life, then we're also dismantling so much of that for other people. Got it, got it. Yeah. Okay, um, let me, for lack, because of lack of time, Leela, I'm, I'm gonna come to you in a moment with, with the, the next question. Um, because it was me, myself, who was uh, diver diverting, but that's okay, That's it's lovely to take the conversation where it's going. So, as Leela, as you already said, uh, we're in a moment, uh, you know, NGOs tend to have a strong tendency to, to what academics call isomimicry. They like to, they copy others who they consider 
worthy of following or or uh, successful, whatever, however that is measured. And feminist leadership, uh, uh, one could argue, it has been adopted uh, increasingly by some NGOs and by some bilateral and multilateral organizations, etc. That always then makes me think, okay, so let's not start make this into um, into an ideology. Let's say, let's also look, are there situations that the two of you have encountered, starting with you, Lila, where you found that feminist leadership hits upon its own limitations or its own inbuilt dilemmas and trade-offs where we just need to look at that uh, straight in the eye, if you will. So Lila, what are what your things, uh, thoughts about that? I mean, there's so many dilemmas and trade-offs. I don't know, where do I start? <laughs> I know, okay. Because you're hitting up against power structures all the time and you're, you're constantly having to think about compromise and uncertainty and messiness. And there is no blueprint for this type of leadership. Um, so there's, there's, there's many, many tensions, you know, in, in, in contexts where uh, organisations where there is sexism, there is patriarchy, there is racism, there is there are rigid organizational hierarchies you're you're having to deal with a lot of resistance um i think in it becomes difficult when we're dealing with um organizations where there is discomfort with uncertainty and messiness and i'm thinking here of the way Kirti set up uh, her organization, Red, e Red Elephant, there were no predetermined outcomes in a way, right, Kirti? It wasn't like you were saying, I'm setting out to train X number of, of young people, but, but this is a sector that likes quick, tech, you know, quick technical fixes um, and often quick technical fixes to solve very political problems. And I think feminist leadership is a political approach that can be really messy. And, and there's this saying, you know, the river runs muddy before it runs clear. Mm. And we need to be kind of comfortable with that. And it's and, and have the institutional courage to sit with that process. And, and it's very difficult because, you know, few organisations feel able to do it. Perhaps they feel constrained by upstream requirements from donors. Um, and feminist leadership is asking us to relinquish some of that control. So that's not really a built in tension. It's more it's more the tensions that come about when feminist leadership is practiced in everyday settings. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what Kirti thinks. Yeah, what Kirti, how about you? Have you encountered those? Plenty. I actually have to agree with what Leila said. The whole piece about donors and their willingness to put money in you is so tied to what you can show them as results. And those results are almost always reduced to numbers, right? But, but I think that in a way, something you also prepare for when you're engaging in feminist leadership, because you know from the get-go that you're a square peg in a round hole, and that there are going to be things that will call on your emotional labor to constantly strive to explain or shift perspectives on. I've seen this myself when the only woman in a boardroom full of men in suits who from the beginning we would already assume that I'm the intern in the room to get them coffee or the note taker in the room. Um, and then the softest spoken voice that doesn't need to be heard in that conversation. But a lot of times the agenda that I would go into those rooms with were almost swept away because I would spend 90% of my time trying to justify why I'm there. Mm. Um, and it's, it's a very tricky place to navigate because you know you want to be the change you want to see. So you know that you also have to invest in the knowledge creation of that change. And so you'll have to center what you're doing as the story piece in all of these. Um, but it is draining. It's emotionally draining. It is taxing. And it's also um, a very difficult place to be in because, of course, there is so much reflection happening in terms of your own privilege and positionality. But when you're struck by the system um, that is hell-bent on, on sidelining you or elbowing you out of the way, the reflection also takes a beating on several occasions. I know I have allowed my emotions to come front and center before my reflections, which is not the best way, but it's a very human way. Uh, so, so my sense is that in so many ways, because we're shifting what I think is the root cause of the challenge, these are going to be pitfalls we will encounter until the tree falls. 
until the tree falls. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll keep I'll keep thinking about this. Um, what I, can I build on that? Can yeah, I just yeah, please, build on please. it? I think the the big one for me, or the big question for us as feminist leaders, is particularly when we're trying to implement it, in, implement our agenda in quite hostile settings or big institutions, or you know, we're trying to kind of termite our way into in, institu progressive our progressive ideas into kind of institutional agendas. This this real question that we walk a tightrope, which is how 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 much are we willing to dilute? our progressive agenda in order to let it get on the table. You know, how, how much are we prepared to use the prevailing language or log logics of an institution to get our, our ideas on the agenda? And what are the risks of doing this? You know, when does, when does subversion as a tactic turn into co-option or kind of appropriation? Um, and I think we tread a very fine line. There's a real, there's a real tension there. Um, and I think the risk of co-option of feminist leadership principles is is really high, really high. And I think it's there's no easy answers to this, but it's something we have to be vigilant about. It isn't um, to be. Let me be provocative, because this is not the first um, leadership model or the first set of ideas that was brought from the outside that was unknown to organizations was brought in and there is some journey then walked from subversion to co-optation even if some co-optation is unavoidable maybe it isn't but let's hypothesize for a moment is there still is there still value in has have some things some important things still be being shifted as a result or not necessarily i think it's i don't know i think it's very context specific isn't it and i think we have to ask ourselves as feminist lead, leaders you know prepare you prepare for resistance from the outset you think about what the risks of co-option are and you ask yourselves the question at the beginning of the process you know what are the hills i'm prepared to die on Hmm. What are the trade-offs I'm willing to make and why? And holding yourself accountable to that, holding yourself accountable to your mission, holding yourself accountable to the women you work with. If you work in a big bureaucratic organisation where you're kind of a bit divorced, you know, how are you holding yourself accountable to grassroots women's movements? I think this is where accountability really comes in. And who decides? Who decides what's worth it? Um, that's the question I think we need to be asking ourselves. Yeah. Kathy, what's coming up for you? Well, I, I agree with what Nina said, the whole piece about holding yourself accountable to what you've set um, for yourself as a vision. But I also want to say that some of these things, co-opted as they are, have made some kind of an impact. For example, in communities where there were no conversations around perhaps ending child marriage, a very, a very binarized campaign that talks about girls and boys, problematic as it is, has also opened up room for conversation in areas where there were none. Now that's, that's saying something, but it's not to justify or normalize campaigns that are problematic in themselves, but really just to try to pull out the common thread, the pieces that can work, the strategies that can be useful and meaningful, and then finding a way to make sure that it translates in intersectional and respectful ways, in culturally competent ways, instead of having another profiteer making money out of it. Um, it it's a very context-based thing to think through, and I don't think there's a blanket answer that can work for this. Yeah, no, no, indeed. And with that, uh, to my fright, I'm looking at the time and our, our, our time together has already um, soon has to come to a close. And I'm thinking, wow, I wanted to ask you X, Y, and Z, but we cannot for now. But um, I really enjoyed this very thoughtful conversation. Um, so let me turn to you, Kirti, first. If people want to know more about you and your amazing work, also on, we haven't talked about feminist uh, foreign policy, for instance. We haven't talked about women and digital security, but where can people find out more about you? 
Sure, thank you, Tosca. I think the best place anyone can find out more about me is me. So please feel free to write me an email. Um, my email ID could probably, Tosca, could you toss that into a bio or any? Are you okay with me putting in the show notes? Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. I would so love to have those enriching conversations for people to form ideas about me rather than read about anything and think they have an idea. Okay, so okay. Well, that's very clear. Uh, very clear. Leela, how about you? I think um, I think you can find me uh, via our website, wearefeministleaders.com, and maybe you can share the, the link yes, to that in absolutely. the show notes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, absolutely. And um, uh, yeah, we, we will have all of that. And also, Lila, I was thinking about including your article, your recent article on grief in the workplace. We didn't have time to talk about that either. Um, no time. Uh, yeah, no, that it, it was a good, good uh, article for sure. It made, made me think. So thank you, Kirthi and Lila, for, for your thoughts today, for sharing them with our audience. And I hope that uh, uh, many of our readers and listeners um, and uh, will, will come and follow up with you on, uh, on everything you have to offer. So with that, I am saying goodbye to everybody. This was Tosca at NGO soul and strategy.